All right, let's kick us off with um, Business Ecom, and this is from E. Ahmed, and he says, key things, well, he asks, key things people should do to make a clothing line succeed. Kick us off, what do you think? All starts, all stems with product. Yeah. Um, if you've got a good product, then everything else will fall in line, marketing will become cheaper, well, I suppose advertising will become cheaper, that's the same thing. Um, I guess everything just becomes easier with a good product. Yeah, I think uh, identify the, the space of the market which is unoccupied um, and focus all of your time on creating, a, as Lewis says, a product which is exceptional. Um, as Lewis also said, it reduces the advertising cost. Um, you create word of mouth because the product's exceptional. Yeah, yeah, Me and yeah. you often discuss when we pick up something or buy something and we think we've got a lot of value, we straight away send it to our group chat or we tell our friends, which again, makes them buy, and that's how businesses start to grow. Um, so I think product is definitely the key, uh, the key difference in the current sphere. I see a lot of brands being formed now with mediocre product or you know, a, a basic tee with a logo. Mm -hmm. That's not sufficient. The product has to be unique, has to be priced well. Um, the website has to be creative. It has to be something that people haven't seen before now because it's a very saturated market space. So I think um, take your time, get feedback from people who give you honest feedback, uh, someone you can trust to tell you if it's not good enough or if it's exceptional, someone who's got some experience in that uh, sphere. And um, yeah, just make sure that it's uh, giving people an immense value. But how do you differentiate product? Like, I know you just mentioned a T-shirt, uh -huh. just having a logo on, but we've seen a lot of successes with T-shirts with just logos on, so how do you differentiate between that? I think uh, you have to know what game you're playing in. I think it, there has been successes, albeit short term, of T-shirts with a logo on it, but they don't last long. So you have to know what game you're playing. Are you playing a short term game where you may that logo on the front of a T-shirt may be attribute to, let's call it a Love Island program, and you get all of the, the hottest influencers out and you make a bit of money because kids look up to those people. But that's not a business, that's a short term money play. Yeah. So if you want to create a business which is around five to ten years, it has to be about the design, has to be... Um, if you look at the biggest um, high street brand Zara, they're all about the equilibrium between quality design, good product, fair pricing, and a clean branding. Uh, so you have to kind of, it depends on what you want to be, but yeah. you have to have a, more elements than just a logo on a t-shirt attached to the hottest influencers right now. You'll have no longevity. Okay. Uh, tips for scaling a clothing brand in terms of investing in stock slash marketing. That's from Josh Sewell. Scaling is obviously the most difficult part of any business. Me and you have both experienced this firsthand. Um, and we've seen it and we're seeing it happening now mm. in today's climate. People uh, get to a certain point and they just don't want to employ and get past that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's easy at the start. Well, not easier, of course, it's hard, but it's easier at the start when it's just you, one or two employees, no office, no major warehouse. And obviously the, the margin is you're achieving all of the margin that you set your um, set your business upon on the bottom line, but when you start to, as you said, employ people, mm -hmm. get bigger premises, uh, create a structure, the overhead start taking away that product margin, and you're left with less. So um, I think the the key to stay at scaling is to stretch your resources to the maximum, and then when you're at that tipping point where you just can't cope no more, then take the plunge. So at least then you've got every last drab out of uh, out of your, your current infrastructure. Um, and also I think um, with the owner itself they have to know again is this business going to be around for five years ten years and then that makes different you make different decisions along the way uh, based on what your business is as I said if it's a, a short-term play even for one years two years you keep your overhead super lean you maximize the profit you take out what you need to the business might close you might sell it you don't know what you're gonna do with it whereas if you're playing for five ten years you've got to think a bit different okay but in terms of tips and tricks, there's no real tips. Every, every scenario is different, but um, you've just got to know the game you're playing and know whether you're playing short term, long term, and uh, stretch your resources with that's individual. You've got to upskill, you've got to have, as an owner, you have to be able to do multiple things. Your staff have to be able to do not as many things as you, but one or two things. So you stretch everyone, everyone uh, is ability and they equally is learn and it becomes more cost effective. Well, I think a main point as well that we've touched on before personally um, is 
buying stock, you can't hit the turnover numbers you want to hit if you don't buy the stock. Mm. And we fell, fell, I guess, into that trap, mm -hmm. trying to hit X turnover and you just don't have the stock to do so. So it's almost like, okay, what are you scaling up to? Then build backwards from that and buy the stock to hit those numbers. Yeah. If you don't, you will never hit those numbers, which we've discussed and we see a lot of people now. Uh -huh. They're just not buying the stock they need to sell to hit the numbers. So it doesn't matter how much you scale in terms of people, you can't mm. hit numbers if you're not purchasing stock. That's true. So that's, that's true. a big thing that people need to consider. So if you have a business, just look at your stock numbers and then whatever you've got in your stock, times that by your sell value, you maybe take off 20% for certain discounts and stuff and mm. just see what numbers you're hitting because then you're going to realize, okay, I'm not actually hitting the numbers I think I'm going to hit because I'm buying the stock. Yeah, so sure. put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, absolutely. The stock is the biggest asset ultimately. So uh, if you believe your product's as good as you think back it to is, product. you put your money where your mouth is, as she says. And um, yeah, just, just back it. If, if you're going to order 100 pieces and you think your product's exceptional, they should have no issue ordering triple the amount. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because uh, yeah, you make more money, obviously. Yeah, and you can't spend more on market if you don't have the stock. So it all ties down to that. Like you say, product stock marketing or product marketing stock, whichever way you think it, probably products. Yeah, yeah, product stock. creative, then marketing, and yeah. then that makes your ads cheaper, as you said. And uh, if you've got sufficient stock, then your marketing can just stay on and develop uh, momentum. And then if you're talking about Facebook ads, etc. Well, uh, good job you mentioned that, because oh. that is the next question. Advice on maximizing ROAS on Facebook and Instagram ads. That is from. Dalinar. So this is a question that a lot of people ask me a lot of when people I'm going to do the, do the, the course. <laughs> yeah, so the first things first with ads is if your business fundamentals are poor, your ads won't work. Such as what? So if your product is poor, you're overpriced, your website is not user-friendly, it lacks creativity, it doesn't matter how clever your funnels are, your creatives on ads, you just won't return because your conversion rate on site will be so poor. So they will work, but the ROAS will not be a one to four, it will be a one to one. <laughs> yeah, so they'll, they'll, obviously you'll get clicks to your site if yep. your creative's good, um, but you won't convert. Yep. So I see a lot of people say, oh, I'm, I'm getting all of these clicks to the site, adds to the cart, but there's something, that the conversions are low. So going back to the original point, you have to make sure your product's exceptional, your product is priced fairly to give people sufficient value. Um, your creatives on site, your whether that's the images, they have to be clear, concise, the description of the product needs to be accurate, your sizing guide needs to be clear, that all aids conversion. So once you've got your fundamentals of your business correct, then you can start thinking about advertising, yep. spending some money uh, to get further traffic. So the key fundamentals of Facebook ads is creative, so you need to make sure when people see in the Instagram feed, Facebook feed, whatever, whatever it is, um, that it's eye-catching. We live in a social sphere now where there's so much content mm -hmm. and we're so used to scrolling and if something doesn't catch your eye majorly, we're not clicking through. So the creative has to be really important. The copy, so the copy is the wording that goes on the ad. It can't be spammy. No one mm -hmm. wants to see, no one wants to feel like they're being sold to. It needs to, it needs to be, obviously it's relevant to the necessary product. Or misled. Yeah, or misled. If it's fashion, it needs to, well, tell them what it is. If it's if you're selling screwdrivers, tell them why your screwdriver's different. It doesn't matter. So your, your creative and copy have to be clear, concise, eye-catching. Then your funnel. So there's three segments. You've got top funnel, which is acquiring new traffic, new customers. Your mid funnel is maybe uh, to target customers who have inactive. So when I say inactive, people who haven't shopped for 90 days, for argument's sake. So you show an ad to those people to reactivate so them. What, okay, so what limit would you put on that? So is it six months too long? Um, yeah, I think so. I okay. think if someone hasn't shopped in six months, depending on your product again, if it's clothing, yeah. it's too long. If it's buying a screwdriver, yeah. that might not be too long. Um, so if it's product, I believe you should maybe uh, reactivate people who haven't vis visited your website for 60 days or 90 yeah. days. So you just uh, exclude those people. Um, and then the bottom funnel, which is the, uh, the, the, the funnel that every business should have is retargeting. So for those who do not know, retargeting is people who have gone on your site, clicked on a product, added a, cart, added, added a product to cart, and we all lead busy lives, so we may forget to check out. So what that does, it shows that same product you've clicked or added to cart in their Facebook or Instagram feed, and you get a really high return on that. So there's Facebook in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's, very, it's, it's much more complicated than that, 
But as I said, focus on your business first, then do ads. Ads isn't Facebook ads and Instagram ads isn't a way to make any business work. Mm -hmm. It's just a it's a it's a tool to make a good business hit the Convert, hit the reaches yeah, yeah. it needs to hit. The thing is with that you don't com you don't you don't convert emotion from ads. You no. just you just convert money from the ads. So that's probably a safe thing to say. And emotion when building a brand is is key. So mm -hmm. use it use it where you need to. Um, and also I would say start slow with it. Mm -hmm what you're saying change the things you've just mentioned change them slowly yeah slowly change your ads you know keep everything the same and then change the color of an image and then change the word of an image like one after the other and see how and what would you say test period maybe seven days if you change a color if you change a word and if you change the structure of an ad yeah i would say go with your intuition go with what would capture your attention from a non-biased perspective if you saw this ad in your feed would yeah. you be like wow that's amazing yeah. don't be biased towards your own product but once you've trusted your intuition, if there's like two variants, yeah, test. If you think both are equally as good, you know, you can run them side by side and you can see the results and like it's called an A-B test. Um, and you can see the results and see which people are clicking through more, etc. cetera. Uh, so yeah, always test. Be prepared to lose money in the short term yeah. in that testing period. Um, and, and that's necessary to every uh, new advertising platform that people use as a testing period. And a lot of time it doesn't return. So stick with it, but if you've been testing for four weeks and you're still not returning, then you've got to go back to the first part, like I said, and check, are your business fundamentals as good as you think they are? Yeah, okay. Next question. Thoughts on influencer marketing for a new brand? That's from AKJT11. So you're the man for that, I influencer mean. Influencer marketing, it's different. In today's, in today's climate, I mean, it's very saturated. Everyone's trying to make it, make their money from their phone. Mm. As you know, this TikTok's a uh, mm. it has arose. Um, you've got Instagram now, very saturated. And the thing is, that's what everyone wants to do. Everyone wants to come out of school and just start kicking on their phone and make money from their thumbs. Yeah. That's yeah. what wants, everyone wants to happen. Um, it's a great tool, but it's a very saturated market. So I would just say tread carefully. I think there's some... Uh, it's hard, There's some, there is some very big wins, but I'll mm. say again, tread carefully. Don't throw mm. money at big people expecting to make your money back, especially if you haven't got the fundamentals correct. Mm. So I wouldn't say throw money at influencer marketing until you have the fundamentals correct. Yeah. Then if you spend money on those guys, then if your product's as good as, as it should be, you will make your money back. Yeah. So it's kind of similar to the Facebook ads, I guess you're saying is like, if, if your brand's really good and you, liaise with the right people then you'll get some returns correct and then correct me if i'm wrong but if you have a really high profile influence that don't expect to return just expect that they can be good for brand reputation yeah. but know when you're doing that that's an, yeah and that's an intangible thing they'll be yeah. good for they'll be good for a brand reputation it's just it's such a saturated market and because so many influencers have jumped on the same bandwagon yeah. everyone has seen people post they just scroll past it anymore yeah. everyone knows that's listening you see someone else selling flipping Herbalife or some bollocks like that, you just keep scrolling past it. Yeah. So it's too, it's so saturated now. So you just have to be careful and just think, okay, what is the type of stuff that I would listen to? So good thing now is people are sponsoring podcasts because podcasting is not a new thing, but yeah. it's new to advertisers. So people are getting a massive return on investment on podcasts. Yeah. If we were to mention something that we used, a lot of people listening would go and, and click it. So that is a certain thing you could spend money on that would work. Mm. There's certain things, i.e. the IG posts and stuff, but they're just so, again, so saturated. It, 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 mm. All comes down to product, I think. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with you. I think it's very saturated. There is obviously some big wins, but not many. I think you need to have a method to the madness now. Yeah. I yeah. think you have to understand what's the average click-through rate of, a, of an Insta story, how many people f who see the person's Insta story actually swipe up and go to your site, work out a conversion rate from those swipe ups to see what, what return you're gonna get. And I think you have to put them into tiers. You mentioned about high profile people. They're good for brand reputation, prestige, but may not make you any money. So it might be an intangible long-term thing, mm -hmm. which, which may be good depending if you're, if you're selling a high, high class product or high price product. Then you've got your middle level, I believe, which can be the balance between a bit of prestige but good content. So you can, you know, uh, you might break even on those people. Yeah. Then you might have your micro influencers that are like, that are like you know, zero to 50,000 followers, zero to 100,000 followers, whichever you want to put 
in those tier, which can make you a ROAS. So I think as long as you know what you're doing and know where you're spending your money and distributing it, you can get like a, almost a break-even ROAS and you can have micros making you money, the mid-tiers having that balance between prestige, brand reputation, content, um, and break-even. And then you have your high-tier uh, influencers, which are just purely about profile and lose your money. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think a lot of people see fashion brands or, or any brand and go, oh, we can make a company do influencer marketing and we make money, right. but that is evidently not the case. Um, most people burn a lot of cash on influencer marketing. Um, it's not the answer. The answer is the fundamentals, as we always yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else from you on that? No, I say, yeah, start off learning Facebook ads before you learn influencer marketing in this day and age right now. True. Um, and just look at emerging channels like TikTok. I'm sure there's some very, very, very big wins on there. Mm -hmm. We haven't converted from those channels yet. However, I'm sure spending one pound on there is going to make yeah, you a lot yeah. of money back. Yeah. I can't, we can't, fully can't comment on it because we haven't fully done it yet. Mm. Um, but yeah, okay, let's go on to the next question. Uh, what is a good amount of money you can start with when starting a clothing brand? That's from Speech Williams. What do you think? You started with nothing, so... You need to, well, I think you can start with well. nothing. I mean, when I was 17, I was making money off, off, off Facebook, just basically off ads, mm. making like 17 to 30k a month, depending on what month it was. So Elaborate on that. So basically, I was using Facebook pages to push traffic, just so everyone has pages like, mm -hmm. uh, like they were not motivation, motivational pages, and then I was using that to harness traffic to push to a website, which then had Google AdSense on, okay. and a thousand people would go to the website, they'd click on loads of pictures, yeah. and we were then putting ads underneath oh, the okay, next yeah. clicks, so as people went to click on click next bait. Click, well, they'd, yeah, kind of. And they'd yeah. click the ads and then it might be two pounds, but obviously you've got a thousand people clicking miss, and yeah, you've got 10% yeah. miss clicking. Over the course of a month, that adds up to a lot of money. So you don't need a lot of money to start anything. You can mm. drop, you can make a drop shipping company. I know a lot of people that do drop shipping brands. Yeah. So you really don't need a lot of money to start. I really hate that question because it, it's an impossible question to answer correctly. Yeah. So you can start with... if. Okay, off. you can start with no money or you can start with £100,000. If you start with £100,000, you can just accelerate your speed a little bit quicker if you know what you're doing. Yeah. If you don't know what you're doing, then you can throw money at things that aren't working and yeah. then you don't know what is working, so you actually lose time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Whereas true. if you start really slow, at least you then take what works and you take out what doesn't work and you can just backseat that and just keep building on things that work. But if you're throwing a lot of money at something, yeah. you don't know what's not working. Yeah, I think it depends on your industry as well. If we're talking tech here, yeah, we obviously you obviously need a lot of money, but in clothing, especially with the mar margins, if it's made in, in China, etc., there's so much margin to play with. You can start with a thousand pounds, and if you sell through your product, yeah. you make five thousand pounds, and then you keep flipping. That's how we started. Um, and I think people want the answer to say you need a lot of money to justify the fact that it's not working for them, but it's not the case. You just need to make good product, buy what you can afford, and make sure it sells and flip it. Uh, it's as simple as that really and you keep flipping and you keep flipping make sure you keep enough for your VAT and your tax etc but it's as simple as, as, as make sure the product's exceptional uh, buy 100 units if you need to and price it at a fair price yeah. keep your overhead slow and you make money all the time I, I don't uh, people often ask me how much do you start with but it's irrelevant because as you said someone could start with a million pound it doesn't mean they're going to be successful mm -hmm. effectively the person with more money is at a disadvantage because they don't value the true bootstrapping uh, entrepreneurial spirit. They think, oh, we can throw money at everything and wait for one of them to work, which does work for some people, mm -hmm. but you have to have very deep pockets. It's a really, really big advantage of starting small because you value, value every dollar or pound or euro and you make sure it works for you. Um, and, you know, I, ask, I get asked questions frequently, oh, if you didn't play football, would, would it have been easier? And I'm like, well, there's a lot of footballers who are much more successful than me, much richer than me. Who hadn't? Who've had brands who which don't exist anymore? So it goes to show it's all about making stuff that people want. No celebrity or influencer or amount of money is going to make you successful anymore. It's all about giving people what they want when they want. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we've kind of already covered this, but what do you think the main reason most clothing brands fail these days are? Insta London. That's from. What do you think? Again, just trying to run before they can walk, trying mm. to do everything, not learning from what they're doing, trying to employ 
too fast without actually learning the roles themselves. Mm. Uh, I think that's a, a massive one. Neglecting every part of the company um, and trying to be insta-famous with a company. Mm. I think that's just why people fail. Egos, we spoke about this earlier. Everyone has an ego and everyone wants to try and exploit that, especially with Instagram. Everyone wants to take a picture of how much money they've made or you know, how many people they've got in the office or mm. you know, they want to rent the biggest car, the, the most expensive car they can mm. as soon as they can. Yeah. And they're falling into the pitfalls. And they're just in the they're just in the fishing net, just like everyone else. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it comes down to egos or not understanding what business what business uh, business model you have. Uh, if you're in a short term play, you need to make sure you keep all of that money, yeah. pay staff as little as they can, extract the money, and then flip it into a project which is long term. Yeah. If you are playing long term, uh, yeah, don't let. Don't make business uh, don't make ego decisions. Make business decisions, and I see that a lot as the businesses start to grow. They just want to do stuff to make the owner look successful or look uh, be the man or be the woman. And I think it, you just have to continuously make business decisions which make money, whether that's investing back into your staff, your infrastructure, your stock, whatever it may be. Don't start throwing influence of dinners to get everyone tagging you as a as an owner. That's just. just do you think? Do you? I've just thought this now, but do you think? The guys that are most of these guys that are making the brands that are failing, do you think they're thinking way too short term in terms of they've okay, they've made it, they've got further than they actually thought, and they actually don't see it as a long term brand. They just think, I'm gonna make as much money as I can now and kind of or do they just are they so delusional they just think that they're gonna take it to, you know, higher heights and hundred million and stuff like that? What do you think? I don't think they think that far. I think they're just loving the attention, they're loving the ride and uh, happy to be there, happy to, as you said, be way further than they ever anticipated, but it always implodes, unfortunately. And, uh, and and I think most of the time people start the brands because they don't they don't really have a true understanding of the field, whether it's fashion, active, whatever it may be. They do it because they see other people doing it mm. and think it's cool. They, they don't have a true understanding of what people want. They may have had a bit of, uh, they might have a great time or a bit of luck and it's propelled, but then after one or two years, luck runs out and then it's about ability, it's yeah. about seeing the future, it's about um, uh, employing the right people, making the right moves, removing your ego. And I think, you know, everyone can have one or two good years in this game, but after five years, 10 years, it's about excellence. And that's, uh, Do you think uh, they don't respect the market? No, I think they think it's easy. I think it's beginner's look sometimes. I mean, you've both had good luck in the short term, but then we had the reality check where it's like, okay, well, this seems too easy. What's the trick? Mm. But then obviously we learned the hard mm -hmm. way in, in other years. And, and then you, you kind of come to the reality of, like, okay, okay, well, as you said, you can't neglect any area of your business. You've got to focus on everything at all times. Otherwise, before you know it, one year, everything that you've worked for the last yeah. five years is gone in a blink of an eye. And do you think timing and look comes into that? Because obviously people that create brands based on you know the right time or a little bit of look and they get it on the right person, it just absolutely pops. Mm -hmm. Do you think that kind of plays, they don't realise that that's what's happened? Yeah, 100%. And timing is everything. Um, and we all need a bit of a look with everything we do to, to get off the ground running. But as you said, if you don't understand that you've hit something at the optimum time yeah. and you don't understand you've had a bit of luck, you start to believe you're a genius. And that's how then you see delusional seeps in. We've discussed that before, though. We, were, we discussed it earlier. The timing and look, we can now see brands that are getting that uh -huh. and they themselves don't understand that that's what's happened. Yes, they've jumped on it with extreme effort, but to take it to the next step, they're going to run out of that and they mm. need to just kind of rein it in a little bit and just now to start to personally develop their own skills to take. Because if they don't do that, it's just going to, as we said, run out. So. And it works the other way. You can have a, someone who's actually talented has launched a brand or a product at the perfect time yeah. with the perfect looks. And they don't realize that if they actually just put more money into marketing or put their product in uh, more places, they can even grow faster because they're actually talented. I look back. 18 months ago when I was doing Facebook marketing and I looked at the cost per acquisition or the uh, the CPM, the cost per thousand views and it was so cheap and I think, oh, why didn't I spend more? But again, that was because the product was decent, the timing was good and I should have spent more. And you told me. Yeah, and <laughs> and you, you know, because you, obviously you've been in the lows and you didn't want to go back to the lows. So you were a little bit cautious, obviously, yeah. of course. Yeah. Hindsight is a wonderful, thi wonderful yeah. thing. So, But obviously now you you know you should put more money in For it than you bank, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's only going to go up. Facebook ads are only going to go up. Yeah. And as you said, you need to look for channels, whether that's TikTok, whether that's Snapchat ads, 
underpriced attention. You need to find it and, and spend money in. We've got a test budget that we always, every month we test new channels to see if there's a, a ROAS. If not, yeah, yeah. we just we, we test something else. But anyway, let's keep it moving. Um, okay, so next question we have is from Marcus. Aurelius, I think. Aorus, sorry about that. Aurelius, Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius. Aurelius. It's a philosopher. Oh. He's the man, he's the man. <laughs> there you go. How do you spot trends and how do you find them and what's about to pop off? So how did you do in the early days? How did you uh how did you how did you know what would work? I don't know what was, was gonna work. I think trends are one of those things that okay. If, it, if I'm thinking past tense, how do you spot trends? I would be looking at, obviously, social media, what everyone is doing. Mm. People have, like, the selfie sticks. That's like a trend, and everyone could jump on that to make some money. That mm. was a trend back in the day, and I'm sure a lot of people made a lot of money. Mm. So you can always see a, a trends that people want to do. People have a bit of jewellery that looks good at a certain point. They might have, like, a, a piece of jewellery that has a, has a teddy on it. That yeah. might be, And everyone's wearing it. That's a trend. Yeah. You could order those from the internet sell them on eBay cheap and that's kind of a trend. Mm. Um, some trends you fall upon by accident, you just get into a certain game because you like it and then you start to sell a product and it sells a little bit better and all of a sudden you're on the back of a trend that you didn't even realise yeah. was happening. Yeah. And then you know you, you jump ahead of that trend and then you start creating a trend and then everyone follows your brand for the trend. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the brands that go to the sky. Mm. So if you can get your brand to fall in front of a trend and you're leading the trend, that's when you're gonna make some serious money. Mm -hmm. These brands, as I mentioned, if you're gonna jump on the back of things like selfie sticks, blah, 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 you're only gonna make a little bit of money, but that's fine, just back pocket that and keep building up until you can get something where you get ahead of the curve. Again, it's knowing which game you're playing long term or short term flip, right? Correct. Yeah. No, which is... I think your point you mentioned about social media is important. I think you have to keep your ears to the street, you have to be very observant, follow the right channels, follow the innovators in social media yeah one thing i will say about social media is because the best are observant on those channels if you are you're always playing a reactive game i feel like in terms of spotting trends personally i look in public domain so whether that's shopping centers just walking the streets what people are wearing in the office and a spot whether that's color palettes or silhouettes uh and i, and I think environments where realistically people are going to wear these clothes whether that's in workplace or as i said going for a meal or going shopping so this is for fashion related yeah, yeah fashion yeah, related yeah. i think that right. instagram you've got these really cool kids really really cool kids they dress really dope don't get me wrong but the majority cannot pull those clothes off so if i was to look at those people yeah i would be making clothes which would isolate the majority so it's that equilibrium between being cool being innovative trend setting but making sure that the silhouette the color is in line with what the market is comfortable wearing, mm -hmm. because you can make close to one percent, but you'll never get rich from that. You'll make a cool small brand, but uh, if you wanna if you wanna be successful and grow and scale, you've got to have the balance between supplying the masses, supplying the fashion forwards, and then supplying the real fashionistas. Yeah. So I think you've just got to take social media, look at the fashionistas, serve a small percent of that, look at most, uh, as I said, general locations where people are going, serve that's your core. And then you can make your basic stuff. But again, that's never going to make you a millionaire. It's a nice add-on product such as a plain white t-shirt or a, give me something plain, a tailored trouser. Yeah. Like, they're not going to propel you, but they're nice add-on buys once you've got your kind of yeah, yeah. fashion forward product sorted. So would you say, okay, let's base it now back to, to, to ads. Mm -hmm. Do you think trend-led products are better for ads or do you think plain, tea, plain tees and uh -huh. fashion are better for ads? So that mid-customer, not super, super fashion forward, but not plain Jane. That kind of like, oh, that's quite cool. I can see myself in it. What more have they got in we're talking fashion yeah. here? If it's a screwdriver, I don't know how a screwdriver can be different, but let's say it can work on several different heads. Let's say it can adjust to Phillips or yeah, what, yeah. whatever. That's, right. that's something unique for a, fashion, for a screwdriver. It's still just a job, but it can do two in one. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. show something a little bit innovative, a little bit different, eye-catching. There's no point in showing a plain white t-shirt on, on ads. It's not going to work. There's no point in showing a, a t-shirt with a, a plastered logo on which the logo means nothing to the consumer. It's just a, another oh, another copy and paste job, do you know what I'm saying? So it has to be something eye-catching and different. Okay. Okay, next question. Um, has money ever been tight or a moment when you thought you may need investment? 
MRAs. That's yeah, for me personally, I don't know if uh, I've said this uh, story before previously, but I think it was 2017. Uh, we was making the Black Friday order, and uh, I think we ordered about a million pound worth of stock for the autumn winter. And uh, this is when I wasn't so technical with ordering stock. It was just kind of like, oh, I know it's going to sell. Just mm -hmm. order it, which is quite wild, at, you know, at that level. Um, but when the order came to be placed. We had the money, but it was tight because obviously when you order stock for autumn winter, uh, this time we didn't have credit facilities, we didn't have uh, payment terms. It was just we, we made the order and paid it thirty percent deposit, seventy percent balance. So the balance was due, uh, and obviously once you pay the balance, it has to come on C, which mm -hmm. takes ninety days. So basically, call it eight hundred thousand pound had to go out, but I still had to pay the stock in the months leading up to that. Obviously, wages leading up to that, so the money was quite tight. So at the time, I had a. Uh, Rolls Royce and Lamborghini, bad investments, but I like my cars. And I had to sell those almost within a week because I needed to mm -hmm. make sure there was enough money to, to pay everybody and pay for the stock that was due for the, the normal releases. So yeah, that was a, that was a stressful time. Uh, I mean, I, I lost quite a lot personally on those cars, but like I said, you've got to do what you've got to do. Um, and and that, that's what teaches you, like, like I said, if that hadn't have happened now, our stock planning or whether that's increasing uh, or, or having a, a credit facility which allows us to plug those gaps at a very very small interest rate i would never have thought to do those so yeah. those bootstrapping stars as an entrepreneur are part of the game and the yeah. most the, the most uh the best lessons you can have but that wouldn't have led to investment would it no no that so obviously we would never really take external unless you really needed it no no so no. that would be like Let's say, we, it depends what point you're at, but I guess at this point, you would have just ordered less stock and just took a hit on, on, on the growth instead of taking an investment because you can't click your fingers and get investments no, straight away. No, no, you can't do that. So, and as you say, it was quite structured anyway. Yeah. I think in regards to getting investment, if you're, if you're a, a fashion brand or e-commerce brand in clothing or anything, cotton or jersey-based, investment's not going to help you. Investment just means you're not doing your job effectively. Because, like I said, with the margins, you have to be doing something really bad mm -hmm. to be burning that amount of money. I see a lot of uh, newer brands taking investment and that they think that's propelling them. But guess what? You're giving away equity. Uh, you're giving away control. Uh, they are the shot callers. So it's not really even your brand anymore. Um, and furthermore, you need to look at them and go, well, why am I raising capital for something which, as we've both said, if you've got a good product, you get the ads out there. You make a return and you have instant cash flow. So why would you take investment to do something, unless it's to open stores, but yeah. you shouldn't even be thinking of open stores if you haven't got at least, what would you say, eight-figure turnover. Oh, you, sh yeah. you shouldn't Which, be thinking yeah. about and it. it. Uh, well, it, yeah, it comes back to don't run before you can walk. You shouldn't, you should never need, you shouldn't need that unless you're tr really trying to run before you can walk. Yeah. For me personally, the only time I'd even consider an investment, if I, if I wanted to open 50 stores, and that's about it, I think. Or saw a major enough that you couldn't, couldn't dismiss. Yeah, and that would be selling selling the business, of course. But no, I think any any e-commerce brand now, uh, like I said, in apparel, it's taking an investment. It, I think you just need to assess your skill set. I'd love to know both of your personal views on property. It's from Jacob Billar. So I know we have different views on property. We do. We have different views. Um, so Reese is taking the view from external point of view mine used to be external but now i've actually got into property yeah. i can relate from a personal point of view actually actually getting involved in it so i've built houses from scratch bought land and then built flipped houses and i've got rental properties yeah so i can attack it from all angles uh -huh. it all comes down to how much money you've got for one uh -huh. it all comes down to what you can do with the money you've got in terms of your personal skill set because i know a lot of people even around me that mm. want to get into property but they won't build a house from scratch because one they can't afford it and two they're just not that way inclined mm. they wouldn't ring people to get things sorted so they'd end up proactive. losing money they're not very proactive yeah. they'd end up losing money mm -hmm. so it all comes down to the person i think a good rule of thumb for anyone if someone has let's say twenty thousand pounds because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say £20,000 because within time, that's a good number people can get. Yeah. I would say if you want to get into property, get your first house, live in it, uh -huh. get the worst house on the street. Let's say if, you, if you're looking on, let's say the best way to find a house, if you're on right move or just somewhere local to you so you know the area, mm -hmm. only buy where you know there's going to be some shops, people want to live there. 
And if the average house price is, let's say, £200,000, mm -hmm. try and find a house that maybe an old person's lived in mm -hmm. and then an old person's then deceased, so it's maybe like £150,000. Yeah. The family are selling it off yeah, yeah, yeah. cheaply because they want the money because that's all people care about when they're, you know what I mean? It sounds bad, but when yeah. someone's grandma or something dies, that people just want the money, that's what it's like. Mm. So they want to quickly sell the house, no stress. They'll sell it for 50 grand less, so you yeah. can buy it for 150,000 pound. That gives you a little margin to play with, so you buy the house, 150,000 pounds. You know, you do the house up, might spend 15 on it, and then you can sell it for 200. And you will also get a tax uh, benefit, and you won't have to pay any capital gains tax on that. Because it's your first property, Because right? it's one of your properties, you can do that every six months if okay. you live in it, as yeah. long as like your meters and stuff are going around. This is all UK-based information for everyone listening. Okay. Um, and with that, if it didn't sell, at least it's your house and you live in it. Mm -hmm. So you can then stay there and just pay the mortgage off, say four hundred pound a month for whatever it may be, just the actual interest on the mortgage. So if it doesn't sell, then what have you really lost? You're living in the house anyway. Yeah. So you could then remortgage the house and take some money out and leave the deposit in, which would be the money you've you've profit profited. Mm. Simple way to do it. I would suggest that to anyone else, anyone that has a little bit more money and want and has that you know, go about them, I would say flip on a larger scale. I wouldn't say do a plot at all for your first, I'd say flip. You mean so you, plot as in building a house? Sorry, right? when I say plot, I mean build a house from scratch. Okay. I know a lot of people like the look of those things, but from my personal experience, if you think it's going to take a year, it's going to take two. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to make a hundred thousand pound profit or a million pound profit in what you think is a year, mm -hmm. it's going to take two years. So mm -hmm. half that. And then also when you build a new property and you sell it to someone you have to maintain that property for two years after right. again UK based information so if something goes wrong within two years you have to sort it yes you have warranties but that's only structural so if right. the roof collapses then they will sort that but if the plaster cracks and all this stuff you have to maintain it the plumbing right. goes blah 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 so there's hidden costs there's, there's hidden costs to, to, to both but I'd say yeah don't build just try and flip and then um, once you've got a little bit more money, you can then diversify and start leveraging your money, which yeah. means lending money from the bank. Say, say you're going to buy something for £250,000, you put £50,000, you borrow 200 and then that just makes you get a bigger uh, a property for your money. But yeah. I'd only do that once you you understand the game. Yeah. yeah, that's good information. I mean, my personal views is like I've never understood why people spend well save all their money and then buy a house to personally live in unless as you said it's under market and you've got some residual on the other side uh you're a big fan of grant cardone as am i uh big fan of robert kisayaki who writes rich dad poor dad and they both say do not buy the house you live in it's not an investment uh, and i agree personally i think uh in my personal life now the money that i have i think well where's my skill set my skill set mm -hmm. is creating really good product. So why would I put, let's call it, let's say if I'm buying a half a million pound house, 20% deposit, why would I put 100,000 pound into a, an asset where I could, uh, assets such as a house, where I could put 100,000 pound into a product, flip it in 90 days and make much more. So I guess it depends on your skill set, as you said. If you're, if you're not creative or you're not gonna start a business, property's safe, slow but safe. Um, depends on your personal finances, mm -hmm. if you've got, Twenty thousand pound, yeah, you're probably off, right? Just buying a house and trying to find an undervalued house if you've got a bit more. What about rentals? So if you've got hundred thousand pounds in saving, I would say personally, you can disagree or correct me. Buy three or four rentals, twenty five percent buy to let. Yeah, it depends. Yeah. Get your five hundred pound cash flow each month, and then every year potentially build. Yeah. Build in that portfolio. You can do that. And that's very simple. That's very easy. That's very hands off. Okay. You can pay. You can pay uh, estate agents to do that for you. I think it's like, say, a ten percent fee and half the fee up front. So if someone pays five hundred pound a month rent, you pay them two hundred and fifty pound for the agent. You yeah. get two fifty back for the first month, and then okay. you pay them like a thirty pound fee, fifty pound fee a month. They collect the rent. They do everything for you basically. So it's very hands off, very safe. But you're gonna trickle money in. But uh -huh. It's better than leaving money in the bank and not yeah, doing yeah. anything with it. Absolutely. Well, yeah. You, you, if you, if any money is in the bank, it's money's wasted. Again, going back to Grant Cardone, he says, if the money's not put to use, it's worthless, right? So right. staring at the, your bank account and seeing money, it's not nothing to be proud of. You need to get that money to work for you and uh, potentially make, uh, well, beat, beat inflation effectively. So what's 
inflation at 2%, 3%. Probably, it changes all the time. Changes all the time, but yeah, just make... make <laughs> the way it. they're changing these Mars bars and Snickers, flipping yeah. it, getting smaller, getting smaller and more expensive. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. But I do think what you're saying to Key, you have to understand yourself. Mm. If you're not that way inclined to make more money elsewhere, or you can't make money elsewhere, then yes, put it into property, I agree. Yeah, so if you're not creative, do property. If you are creative, try and be let's, creative. Let's not beat around the bush. Making a brand and selling a brand is hard. <laughs> hard and some of the best money you will ever, ever make. If you get it right. If yeah. you get it right. However, very, very, very few people can do that and mm. it's very high risk and high stress. Property, as you say, is low risk, low reward, unless you start leveraging your money and you start to get into the bigger stuff. But that's quite high risk leveraging, Again, isn't it? Again, starts to get high risk. Mm. That's why I say learn about property with just flipping houses because it's very, very, very low risk. Mm. That's what I'd say. At the same time, scared money doesn't make money. So if you want to make big, you have to bet big, I guess. That's just how life works. It's just the same with everything. Correct, yeah. The self-development part, for anyone that's just tuned in from a timestamp, Favourite books. This is a question that you get asked oh, God. all the time. This is from Dan Barber. So obviously books are good for different scenarios, but if I had to give people five books that everybody could read, I mentioned it earlier in the bit, book, yeah. early in the video, Robert Kisayaki, Rich Dad Poor Dad, that talks about money management. Um, I would say How to Win Friends and Influence People by, by Dale Carnegie. That talks about kind of like psychology of humans, you know, how to make people feel wanted, loved, and you know, what it says in the title, how to win friends and influence people. It sounds a bit corny, but yeah. it's obviously a good book. I would say Start With Why by Simon Sinek. So that just, just that discusses purpose uh, and why you do anything. You need to understand every task that you have in life and why you're doing it, why you're getting up out of bed and going to, uh, out of bed and going to work or or why you're in a relationship or whatever it is, you need to understand why and have a purpose for it. I would say Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Uh, that talks about visualization. It's like The Secret, but with much more depth. For those that don't know, I think The Secret is bullshit. I think it's just a, a book which people think, oh, um, think about good things and good things happen. There needs to be some action, there needs to yeah. be more philosophy and strategy behind that. Uh, is that three? Three? I would think 80-20 rule. I can't remember the author of that. That book basically says that within every bit of success, 20% of the results create 8% of the rewards. And you'll see this, uh, you'll see that kind of pattern emerging and everything, whether that's your friendship. So uh, two out of 10 friends will give you 80% of the value or care or uh, advice or knowledge or yep, whatever it yep, is. Yep. I think, and then lastly, no, why not? Daily Stoic. So you mentioned Marcus Aurelius, the one, the name. Oh, the yes. Yeah. So he's a philosopher and uh, the principles that philosophers have in stoicism, it's called, or stoicism, stoicism. Uh, the outlook on life is very different to modern world and they're very, everything happens for a reason. And they just teach you good, le good lessons and that's got 365 pages. It's called the Daily Stoic and then everything has a, has a nice purpose and then a nice description and that's by Ryan Holiday. Okay. And again, in terms of books, people don't know where to start when reading books. So just get on Google and just put the best books for self-development or the best books for learning or the best books for mentality. Yeah. A massive list will come up and just start reading through them. Yeah. I mean, most people asking about books haven't even read a book. Yeah. Get stuck in straight away. And reading is not an easy thing to get stuck into, though. I mean, like at the start, you said it to me recently, it's hard for it to kind of stay in your mind or, you, or keep concentration. So... I think there's a question later on about... Um, well, I, I, well, we'll move on to it now. So yeah, someone sure. else asked, asked the, a question, audible versus reading, and that was Cam Clearly. And for me, I've always listened to podcasts and I always listen to things online. Yes, I also watch. So things stick in my head mm -hmm. when I watch and I hear, or I just hear that sticks in my head a lot more. Yeah, you're definitely like that. I've been getting into um, listening, uh, sorry, reading Blinkist recently, which is where it's an app. For anyone that doesn't know, that gets a book and then they basically just summarise the book within seven, eight slides. So you can get a lot of knowledge out of a, a small book. But if and if you like the Blinkist, then please just go and read the book. But I've been reading that, mm -hmm. and I'll read it and I forget what I'm reading. I'm reading it and then I forgot the slide before yeah. because 
things just aren't sticking in my head because I've never really done it. I've always listened. Whereas if I hear something, it just sticks in my head. So again, to his question, audible versus reading, they are both good. Do one of them at least. Don't do none of them. Mm. So whichever one suits you, but I'd, I'm trying to read a bit more now because I just I like it. It's got good facts to read. To, uh, to read. It's just different. I know I'm bad at it, so I want to get better at it. Yeah, I mean, when I've, I've been reading for about, I don't know, six years now, when I first started, similar to you, I used to read and have to go back to the page and read it again to make it stick in my head. Obviously, with anything that you practice, you become better at it. What I do now, and this is, I think this is quite a cool trick, is when I'm reading, I obviously highlight anything that sticks in my head. If you have Audible as well, you can have uh, headphones on and, and they read the book in sync. So you're reading, Audible's reading, and you're highlighting. So you've got it going in your ears, you're going through your eyes, and yeah. you're highlighting. And then if you really want to get technical whilst you're reading, listening, highlighting, you can you've type up notes. your notes as well. So then you've got the information going into your brain four, four different ways. And for me, once I do it that way, I remember everything. I'll recite things pretty well. Um, and that kind of speeds up the process so you don't have to go back and reread a page or and what I've learned as an observation for myself lately is if I don't do that I'll read a page and obviously I'm thinking how does this apply to my life can I apply it in other ways or is this some is this does this relate to me and then I'll go off on a tangent and then I'll forget what I've really read and I'll, because my mind keeps wondering so yeah. I think you have to be really focused and even when I'm in my office sometimes when I'm doing my, my, my daily research or reading articles, etc. I have to have noise cancelling earphones, and sometimes just have them in with no sound, just so everything's blocked yeah, out, yeah. and then I can just focus. So I think it's important to do that. I think a key question here is what. Okay, I know people are going to be thinking this, so I'm going to say it. What is the point of reading? Uh -huh. That is the question people are saying, and I think personally, the point is you learn from a lot of people's experience, and also repetition is key. If you keep reading about something, you keep learning, you'll start thinking that way. Yeah. Your actions will change, and actions will then create results. Yeah, I think if, if you don't read, you only ever live one life. If you do read, you live hundreds of lives. What you need to remember is that these people who have wrote books, they are much older most of the time, yeah. much wiser, seen more experiences, and they're basically giving you all of their life hacks in a book for £10. So in value perspective, there's nothing better than that. So I always believe everybody should read. It, don't be disheartened if you can't take it in it, uh, straight away, but you, you kind of see so many different perspectives and you can have your, your family and, and if your family never readers, you're only living through their eyes. No, so you could have uh, information from your mom or your dad and they could give you their perspective, but their perspective could be biased because they've never opened up their brain. So reading is the best thing that I've ever done personally. How important is it to have a daily routine and what does yours look like? That's from Nicholas Bobby. Hope the boys. You can go first. I know we live different, really different lives. So. Yeah, so, well, I usually, well, it depends. The gym is always in my daily routine. It doesn't matter if it's in the morning or at night time. I'll throw it in because one, everything I've ever done is gym related. I mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. So, started, started when I was 17. No, sorry, probably before that, 15. I'm now 27, so I've always gone to the gym. So, yeah. I have to throw that in there. It keeps me, keeps me feeling good. It makes me eat right. Every single day, I feel like I'm getting better. Yeah. Uh, it sounds funny, but it makes you love yourself, especially when you look in the mirror and you can see change. You're like, everyone see, knows see, what, you know what I mean? Everyone knows what, yeah, you see the shreds. Um, what else will I do? You listen to a lot of audio books because you're always pinging it to me. Yeah, yeah, listen what? to a lot of audio books. So I used to, in my car, uh, when I was building one of my plots, it was quite far away. So it was like maybe 30 miles a day. So every day I was driving 60, 70 miles. So I was listening to two podcasts a day, depending mm. on how long it was. So a podcast of some sort is probably in my daily routine mm. uh now blinkist trying to read at least one of these books or at least you know five slides of blinkist yeah, when i can get around to it every single day and that will add up over the year definitely um well you, you're always sending me stock charts lately so st yeah i'm getting it yeah starting to read stocks because me and reese are going to start to get um into stocks in the future big yeah um, so we're starting to learn stocks now. So then when we get into it, when we've already started. So starting to look at stock charts, starting to look at uh, more into financial statements. Um, always researching randomly on the internet, just going down rabbit holes and just, you know, end up flipping out on the, in space. Yeah. <laughs> starting at one place, ended up in space, you know how it, how it goes. Uh, YouTube, social media, uh, just keeping my ear to the wall and stuff. 
And on that point, I always say to you, one of your best skills is spotting potential in people. I mean, over the years, you said to me, this person is going to be a star, this person is going to be a star, and five years later, they're a star. You mentioned McGregor to me, what? I spoke to McGregor back in 2000 and maybe 11, when he'd only had, like, three fights. Yeah. Um, again, people like, someone like Devin Haney, yeah. and that boxer that's coming up, he's just Richard's now really been common. signed by Eddie Hearn. I mentioned that a long time ago. He's going to be the heir to Floyd Mayweather's um, mm. throne. He's going to be the best boxer of our generation coming up. Me? Told me to do MDV. Here we are. Told me to do MDV because <laughs> I spotted the potential in him. I knew he had everything that I had and more. So yeah. he got started on the brand and here we are. Yeah. Um, now that's definitely your phase clan. All of those people, you always say to me, oh, this person is going to be the next big thing. And nine times out of ten, you're right. So... Yeah, you keeping your ear to the street on mm. social, YouTube, etc. has definitely paid dividends and I'm sure it will excel in the future too. I can't think about that. So Thrones, obviously, you know, my, my normal business stuff with property, um, brands, whatever else I'm doing, that's all thrown into the same day. So yeah, I'd, what about yourself? Uh, so I go into the office always Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So my days, uh, in uh, those are very structured. So I have... Uh, Sales report meetings, marketing meetings, fit sessions, design meetings, product briefs, etc. Um, and then just de dealing with the staff generally in queries. And then on Friday to Monday, I work from Starbucks, I work from home. And that's kind of just being alone in my own thoughts to, to be able to function. Because obviously when people are coming to your office or your meetings, you don't actually do, do your own work. You just assist with everyone uh, else's work and as a collective to obviously take the brand forward. Well, so. that's something you've done, I was just going to interrupt you, that's something you've done quite a lot recently, hasn't it? Yeah. Like you've brought yourself away to gather your thoughts and to uh, evolve the business from a little bit of a far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to, obviously. I don't think a business is a business until it can run without yeah. its owner. So I'm very conscious of just trying to, you know, build a structure around me which can make sure the brand is on an upwards trajectory with, it, with or without me. Uh, but on Sundays, I'd always do, I've got about, I'm not, I think about 40 tabs. They range from fashion news to just general business news to multiple fashion websites to you name it, just trying to take in more knowledge, do my research and see what trends are emerging, uh, etc. So I'm very structured on Sundays. And then obviously there might be one day where I just deal with my day-to-day -day general life, whether that's bloody cleaning in my house or um, sorting, you know, general shit out. So... Um, but yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is definitely very structured. Um, but as you said, I'm always reading, uh, whether that's Blinkist or books. I will always watch podcasts if they're of relevance. Um, yeah, I think every day I must learn. Um, I would like to go to the gym more. I'll probably go to the gym twice a week, which is obviously not good enough. I'm continuing uh, to play golf, so you can get on the courses. And... Yeah, I know. I need to get back on that. A fast Monday to Friday, so I know that's a topic. Well, let's, let's, yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. So. So, did you hear about fasting first when I always said to you, start fasting? Uh, I think I heard about it, but when you told me, let's do this, was it a three-day fast? It was ages ago, yeah. yeah. But, but I used to fast before that, but I did an actual three-day fast where I didn't eat yeah. for, I think, four days, maybe. Yeah, I didn't I did eat two. anything, just, 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 just drank water. Yeah, I did two, and I was like, I couldn't even concentrate at work, so I was like, you continue with the four, two's enough for me. And then I thought, well, I got through, what, 20 hours, plus of it no problem so then i just continued it monday to friday so i only eat between the hours of 6 and 10 p.m um throughout the rest of the day i only drink water or black coffee so there's no calories whatsoever and coffee's good for killing hunger and obviously you keep your brain active as well yeah i think at the, at the beginning it's really hard but after you don't know any different and you're super alert yeah. and also it keeps your weight down because you can only eat a certain amount of calories at, in four hour window so that's one of the best things i've ever done too and most people want to eat at night time. That's when no one cares about. It. I know people eat, wake up and eat in the morning, but it, most people want to get home and eat and just sit on the couch and just eat at night time. So if you can yeah. save those two meals in the day, then when you eat those things in the night, then you're probably going to wake up the next day losing weight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As soon as we do it, we seriously shred up. Yeah, um, yeah, one hundred percent. So I think yeah, fasting. Yeah, and it's only hard when you're not busy. So if you're busy, you don't need to think about it. Before you know it, it's time to eat. Yeah. But if you're it's on the weekend, hence why I don't do it, it's because if I'm just being a bit more sociable or whatever, as you know, it's Harry Bowes, let's eat them. Or, but Monday to Friday, I'm strict. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Work-life balance, the myths and the realities, and that is from Timmy Dada. 
quite well balanced the myths and realities. What do you think? I think if you're going to create a brand, that is your life. Mm. It has to be. Anything you want to do and you want to be successful at has to be your life. There's no two ways about it. Mm. You have to live and you have to breathe it. There's no, there's no messing about. Yeah, if you want to be successful right now in today's climate with the amount of new emerging brands that you have to live and breathe it. Yeah. Um, I would say in the, in the past six years, how many days have I had where I've not thought about MDV or anything else? Probably zero. zero. Yeah, I'm always thinking about something. Um, people say, does that can be draining or does it, is that unhealthy? I think, no. It's, it's an addiction. Yeah, it's an addiction. I couldn't live without doing this thing. This is my life. I could not live without doing doing what I'm doing. If I didn't have my computer and I couldn't yeah. listen to podcasts, I couldn't research business, I couldn't delve into business, I would go insane. Yeah, it's that so. simple. Well, the laptop goes everywhere, doesn't it? If the laptop's not yeah. with me, I'm, I'm, I'm going crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The laptop has to go everywhere. So work-life balance, I guess. If you are truly want to be the best, there is no balance. You're immersed in it. Yes, you can go on holiday, but even when you're on holiday, you're thinking about how you could... It just comes into your thoughts personally. I'm like, I'm not trying to think about it. It just happens. But to us and people that don't have a business, when you have your own company and you're doing everything for yourself and your own personal mm. development, everything you do, every mm. action you take creates you more money, mm. it's not like it's work. It doesn't feel like work. It mm. feels like your life. It's a part of you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's how it feels. So when people, I know guys might be listening from outside looking in and they don't want to wake up tomorrow and go to work. That's because you're working for someone else and you're, living, you're working for someone else's dream. When you're building your own dream, it's totally different and you never, ever switch off. I understand what you're saying, but I don't fully agree because I don't think that, I think this is what people need to see is that being the boss or yeah. being the owner, it's, the first place is often the worst place, as a quote. That comes with the most pressure. I personally believe that not the best position, but a good position is to be, is to work for someone who you admire Work with someone who is, you know, is a very clever or is, is, can take a business a long way and to be closely behind them yeah. because you don't carry the same stress or pressure that they do, the financial risk, but you get all the rewards should the business grow. So I understand your point, but at the same time, it's a good position. If you're in a, comp a corporation or a business where you're early in the door and you're right behind the, the boss or you can speak to them, relate to them on a personal and a business level, that's a good position too because as much as you are you you aren't the owner of the business you are directly in correlation to the results that that business receives should the boss identify you as a key part of the business so um you can still live life as an employee with that desire to always be thinking about work if you're in the right place if you're in a, a 500 employee business and you never even see the boss absolutely not you need to leave and go to a smaller company where you're more valued and the the work that you put in is directly noticeable and everyone can see it. Yeah. But if you're in a big corp corporation, yeah, 100% I agree with your statement. But, and, that goes, and that goes back to our last podcast where you talk about as well, be the best person yeah. you can be in that job. That yeah. will shine and you can only ever get and be this person that you're talking about if you are the best you yeah. in the position you are in. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. will never, ever, ever get there. So if you work for anyone, you have to work to your fullest. You've got to take pride in everything you do. How you do the little things is how you do the big things, you know what I mean? So you might be, uh, you might be washing toilets, it doesn't matter, just do that to the best of your ability. Um, and someone will notice eventually, should you put yourself in the right position to get that reward. Correct. Me personally, whether it's the clean or I value them as much as I value anyone. So if they do their job and they take pride in it, I would want to look after them because I see that the passion they put in. So you need to be in a position where your boss identifies the value you and the pride you take in any form of job you do. Okay, this is a good one from Cole Slick. How do you know when to stop pursuing an idea and to move on to a new one? It's a good question. What do you think? What do you think? I don't really know. Oh, it's a difficult one. That's a very difficult answer. Obviously, it's a, number one is it ain't working yeah. and you're losing loads of money. That's clearly number one. Mm. But again, some things lose money for a very long time and they mm. still work, hence things like Tesla and... Well, I'm still losing money, yeah. They, they yeah. lose money and they're still working. So, again, if, if you're talking about starting any type of brand, I'd say if, if you, I don't know, it's a very tough one to answer, that is. You know, the problem is, yeah, on Instagram, you see these quotes like, never give up. Those quotes, a smart person knows when to give up and go on to the new thing. So, yeah. I think you've got to, again, I said this in the last podcast, you've got to surround yourself with a circle 
who's achieved more than you, who has a bit more experience and clarity to advise saying, this may never work. But at the same time, as an entrepreneur or someone who you cast as a visionary, they won't listen. So they believe that it's going to work, listening to keep working. And so there's no real right or wrong answer. But again, I think it depends on what sphere you're in. If you're in e-com and you can, make, you can buy a product for five dollars ten dollars and sell it for double triple and it's not working you've got a problem if you're selling if you're buying something for a thousand dollars and trying to sell it for five thousand dollars and yeah you might take more time but if you're selling anything between the 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 30 and 50 pound mark and you can't sell it there's a problem yeah so that's when you need to reassess and reassess your strategy reassess your product and reassess yourself is this even for you well i think a good rule of form is just Try and start your first company that's going to make money so you know if things are working. Don't, mm. I'm not going to say don't start a tech company because tech companies are, are the biggest companies in the world yeah. and they're the biggest wins in the world, yeah. but they come with a lot of strain and a lot of money, uh, 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 deep, pockets. deep pockets. So um, I'd say start with something that, and if, you, if, you, if, you're not, if you're losing money after six months, then just call it off and go on to the, ne- maybe, on to the next Maybe thing. a little bit longer than six months because things do take Yeah, time. yeah, again, it will dep- it's a very hard question to answer. But I think the circle you surround is like people will ask me for advice. And if, if I'm in that e-commerce, living it, breathing it every single day, and I say, I don't think it's quite going to work, maybe you should just listen. Okay, or... so what if people haven't got that, which they're not, generally people aren't going to have those type of people around? Ask people. I mean, the beauty of Instagram or social media is now is that you okay, might not get a you response. You get 6,000 messages, but you don't reply because it's too many messages. So yeah. then what? You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's say you're Joe Bloggs and you're asking everyone a question, no one's replying to you, you're starting a brand and you're not making money, then what? <laughs> Look at your conversion rate. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> if you're getting a 0.2% conversion rate at a £50 product, your product's crap. Yeah. So okay. that's the answer all you need. You're getting the traffic to start and no one's buying it. It's not going to work. If you're getting a, if you're getting a steady 2 to 3% conversion rate, it means yeah, it's doing okay. You may not be growing as fast as you can, you just need to drive more traffic. So maybe conversion rate's a good measure. If you're driving the correct traffic and your conversion rate's terrible, yeah. your product's terrible, there's yeah. no other way to, to put it. I think that could be a measure, I don't know what you think on that. And I know people say, start for passion. Don't start for passion. Yeah. You, you wanna start, let's be real, for money. Yeah. So passion comes maybe at a later stage when you start to really enjoy what you do, but no one starts a company just because they, or uh, start selling products or starts a tech company because they say, I want to do this because I'm passionate about it, realistically. Yeah. Um, everyone wants to do it because they want money. Well, let's keep it real. As I said, when you told me, Reese, you need to do start a fashion company, it wasn't my passion. I just had a high level of understanding. Yeah. That was what I did naturally. So I didn't start MDV out of passion. It's passion now because I had a high level of understanding. I further and enhanced, it's your life. Yeah, I've heard, further enhanced my understanding and I'm good at it. So now it's a passion. But initially it was like, oh, you spotted that. I had a good understanding. You knew we could make money. I so he said, Reese. you could convert it. Yeah, so, yeah, 100%, he's, he's right. Uh, I knew if Reese made a product, it would convert because everything he wore, I liked, and I knew if he sold what he was wearing, it would sell. Yeah. So, yeah, it's com- if you're going to start up a, a, a business, you don't have to love what you're doing, but if you, think, if you recognize that you really understand what you're doing more than anybody else, run into that, create more understanding and create a passion it'll probably be work there's things i said to you when we i asked you about the question about your daily routine and he's like i don't really know what to do and i'm like yeah you do you do this you do this you do this this was before the podcast yeah because you, because because you're so immersed in things your daily activities you don't realize what you do which is abnormal so someone could be i don't know someone could take amazing pictures on the camera for, for argument's sake but they may not know that they're actually really good or yeah. it may be so normal to them in the sense of oh, I've always took pictures like this. You may not identify that you've got an immense skill until someone says it to you. So then you could go, oh, well, let me be a photographer for argument's sake. And then you could become the best videographer. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So you've got to identify what you do in your day-to-day activities, which you have a high level of understanding. And yeah, you've got to run away with it. Yeah, I agree. Back to the routine, like you say, I've just thought of something that's pretty a good thing to say. Um, do your routine until you forget it's your routine, it yeah. becomes your daily activity. Yeah, so yeah. before the podcast, what Reese was saying is he asked me a question that we were going to ask and speak to you guys about, and I said, I don't have a routine, mm. <laughs> but I do. Yeah. I just forgot I've got it because it's, it's habit. so habitable. It's, habit it's now, just yeah. that feels like my life. I just totally forgot that, oh, I do all these things. Mm. 
Bit so normal. To me, that's normal, but to everyone else, that's like, what are you doing that for? Like, what are you, what? You doing what every day? You're watching how many hours? You're listening to this? Well, that's, that's it when you build a habit. It's just, it's a habit you don't think about. It's just always been done, and that's the key. That's what that's successful key, people it? have, yeah. They, Good, they huh? do things, like, and then you could spend a day following a CEO or following your idol, and you realize, Jesus Christ, they do all of this every single day. But then they're like, oh, yeah, this is just normal. And that's how you know they're at an elite level because they, their habits are just mind-blowing to people who aren't at that level yet. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. Should you buy into a course and how do you know if it's the right one? That's from a guy called Daniel A. Well, you mentioned on, your, uh, on that last podcast about courses and people selling things and you said you dislike it, but I guess that goes on to... It puts us in that room with everyone that's successful correct. and how she get, again... Back on some of the questions we've answered, mm. helps you get around those people that have a, a same understanding and the same, they want to build the same skill as uh, as you and the same line that you're on. So how would you go about if you were to? We have in never been on a course, no. so for everyone listening, we are not talking about these courses from a personal point of view, that we from a personal experience mm. point of view, because we've never been on one. Yeah. So I can only assume when I say. But well, I don't. I don't know. I've never been on one. Yeah. So I don't know how you. I can only say that you would need to come away and and actively do some of the stuff that they say, and it should produce results. Mm. If it doesn't produce a result, then you haven't learned anything, and the course has been a complete hoax. How do you know? If, how do you know if it's going to get results in the first place? Surely you would want to know if the person said Okay, the so call. yeah, so you would do a bit of research on the guy. So for example, Grant Cardone, um, you would do research on what assets he has. Again, if it's a UK person, let's say, you can company check them, as we say, company, uh, sorry, not, uh, or company's house, yeah, go to the UK and just kick on like, um, find a person's name or a company's name and just type it in and basically just see who owns what, yeah. uh, how much money they've got. You yeah. know, what assets they've got, what their accolades are, what companies they've started. You can see all that information publicly. I'm not sure how it works in America. And then from there, you can see if they're telling the truth or they're completely lying to you. People don't really do their research. They believe what people are saying too often online. If you don't do your research, that's how you get swindled. Yeah, 100%. It's a game of frauds now we live in. As Lewis said, if you're going to buy a course, if you're going to watch our podcast or watch anyone else's podcast and listen to people's advice, or take it on board, just make sure you do your checks. And as Lewis said, all you have to do is go on company's house, look at how much the person owns of that company, look at the balance sheet of that company, and if someone owns 50% of a company worth 100 mil, that person has created 50, 50 million pounds worth of assets, correct? So then if they're selling a course, you can trust that they've lived what they talk about. Please do your due diligence because what you see, as I said in the last podcast, is very rarely real. So some of these, don't get me wrong, some of these courses are given amazing value and a lot of them are just cheating people. So guys, just do your checks. It's free company check. Just do what you've got to do. And I think, you know what? I think most people on these courses are giving out good information, but they're just packaging stuff from Google that any or anyone can Google and get the information. They're just bringing it all into one place, into one PDF or whatever mm. it is they're doing and vlogging it to you. Yeah. But the thing is, is you can't really truly give people advice unless you unless you've really actually advice because there's always blind sides. There's always something that we miss yeah. until you've lived it. Like yeah. until you've been in the trenches or you've had to bootstrap or you've had failures. There's blind side things that you miss. So someone selling that course can completely sell you the course without alerting you to the blind sides that could be happening whilst you're in the process of action. These this advice. Yeah. Okay. We'll go on to general questions now. Again, anyone that's going to get time stamped here, this is going to be for just general questions. What makes a good leader? This is from Ellie Mitch. So I've uh, read a lot about leaders, and I always. Is there a book on leaders? There's a really good book on leaders, I think. I've looked at the blink list. Uh, I'm trying to think. I'm sure there is. Well, there's it... Alex Ferguson is called. There's an Alex Ferguson book called Leading, which is quite good. Okay. Um, there's a few. I can't think of the top of my head. But for me personally, I think a leader has to be someone that you would want to be led by. Firstly, you want to be inspiring. They, a lot of people say don't be the smartest in the room, but I think the leader should be close to the smartest in the room at all time. Otherwise, he's not sufficiently the right person to continue yeah. the trajectory of the business or whatever it is. 
I think you should always be calm, collected, even if the shit hits the fan and people are one day away from losing their job. You've got to be able to manage expectations and instill calmness and try and get out of it without making people panic. So bring people up, bring people down. Yeah, I think a, a good leader is honest, direct, you know where you stand. I don't think uh, a, I don't think a good leader is someone who says you're great and they don't really believe it. They need to tell you exactly where they believe you are. They yeah. could be wrong, but they need to give you a perspective. So if you're doing great and they say you're doing great, they mean it. And if you say you're not doing good enough, you mean it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, have the ability to say, well, you're not doing so great now, but just do this, do this, and you're on your way. So you kind of building people up without getting them on a high horse and putting people in place without making them feel worthless. Um, I think a leader takes uh, responsibility. If, if the team succeeds, it's a shared effort. If the team fails, it's the owner's fault. Yeah. I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, whenever there's been hours of MDV, it's never anybody's fault. It's always mine because I was the person who made those decisions. So they're definitely accountable. Uh, um, clear decision making. Yeah, I think you've got to be sharp. I, I say leaders really have maybe 10 key decisions to make a year. And the highest paid leaders are the people who make those decisions the best. Um, a leader knows how to delegate. Uh, the, high, uh, the lower important stuff so they can focus on those 10 key decisions. Um, I don't know, what about you? You covered up quite a lot, yeah. Hiring on your blind spots, I suppose. That's, again, like you just said. Like Self-awareness. Self-awareness. Yeah. No, I think you've probably covered all points that, that I, would, um, I would go with. Knowing your blind spots, you mentioned that. I think that's key. You need to know where you're weaker. Um, aim to improve it as a leader so it's not a weakness no more or delegate that to someone who's much stronger than you. Um, and leaders produce results, so yeah, the, yeah, a good leader. A produces good leader results. Results, it produces results, and I think the leader makes decisions for the greater good of the whole team rather than an individual. Yeah, I think going back to Alex Ferguson, he was the master of that. Uh, he, if even if he had a, a superstar player, which he's had at some times, if they was disruptive to the greater good of the group, they would be gone. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely key to you. There's no no one person can be uh, fully relied upon to to make the business grow. And that's what I said earlier about even me as the CEO or me as the leader, or whatever, it can't be all about me. It's got to be an equal shared um, responsibility for the team, for everybody to make the business grow. Yeah. Next question. This is from Matty Inn. How much do you think luck comes into play when becoming successful? What do you think? So I personally think that luck is created by mm. time, opportunity and awareness if you don't have the skill to jump on a, a something that's look, gonna could be seen as luck then you, you need skills i don't just think luck plays a part you have to have skills to identify luck mm. i think everybody gets a a great piece of luck in their lifetime and i think it's how people's skill set allows them to really catapult that amount of luck and you also I hate this slogan but you create your own luck if you're actively reading seeking uh, knowledge listening to podcasts listening to audio books you mentioned then you begin to spot opportunities because your mind's in sync with what an opportunity looks like um, so other people would suggest that as being luck when you jump on the opportunity but that is your self-development to spot that luck correct correct and then we spoke about timing earlier on in the podcast um, and timing is key. You could have an immense idea at the wrong time and it won't work. You could have an average idea at the right time and it's going to work. Yeah. So timing for me personally is the most important thing and the, the biggest skill and also the hardest skill to have to be able to understand you in perfect timing. And then that is luck, as you said. Then you have a skill set to propel yourself out of the lucky zone. Luck only lasts one or two years. Then it's about your skill. I mentioned earlier, if you manage to keep a business profitable or active after five, ten years. That's excellence. No one can attribute that down to luck. It just doesn't happen. You see a lot of businesses rise fast and go just as fast. So they might have had the luck. They may not have identified that they've been lucky and they didn't have the skills to take it further. So um, luck is important, timing is important, but skill set is more important because that's what keeps you in the game. Yeah. Okay, um, what we got? So the real calm, goal ambitions for this decade you tell me what's your goal so obviously ambitions? we were looking at back at, at 10 years ago and obviously this school basically yeah um so a lot can change in 10 years but i think um the podcast obviously 
is number one thing. Within 10 years' time, we, we need to be up there with the best. Mm -hmm. We need to be rather than Joe Rogan for sure, mm -hmm. um, within 10 years. Um, I can't, there's going to be, I'm going to be involved with property. Again, I'm not sure to what extent until the next, say, six to 12 months plays out because at this moment in time, I'm selling all my portfolio to then switch it up to start to do a different type of um, property business. Mm -hmm which I can expand on in the future. Uh, so again, I wanted to be doing something with property. Mm -hmm. Stocks and shares, me and Reese have both been talking that we want to do stuff regarding that, investing in companies. So we will be investing in companies within the next two years, whether it's privately or on the stock market, people like Amazon. So the way we're going to look at stocks is who are we going to see here for the next 10 years' time? So when we started the companies, if we had invested in people that we used back then, like, SagePay, PayPal, Amazon, Stripe, Stripe, Shopify, all these companies, they would have made us, if we had the money we had now and invested yeah. in them, we we would have hundreds of millions just from these, probably more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would be, they were some of the best investments of this decade, so we can identify those. So if we were, again, still going to invest right now, and we will be soon, in those safe companies, which in 10 years' time will create you a lot of, uh, a lot of money, Amazon, mm. Facebook, which is highly undervalued. They control the whole market. Shopify Google. at the moment is probably over, overvalued. However, in the next 10 years, it's probably going to keep growing yeah. over that space. Again, we're only going to invest long term. We're not, we're not looking to invest money and then the next day, when it hit, if it got yeah, hit yeah. the floor, sell it. Well, that's trading, isn't it? That's trading. Yeah. We are going to invest money. So if we want to invest £100,000 into a company, we aren't touching that money for another 10 years. Thanks. So that is... I guess just a brief overview of the mm -hmm. investment you might want to touch on it. Um, no, you're right. Yeah, long term plays. Uh, uh, I think virtual reality is going to be a big one. It's, VR, yeah. It's been around for a while. That the technology's been there, but the consumer hasn't really, really took to it. However, we've got well, I've got it in my house here. We played it. It's it's mind blowing. I advise everyone to you say it all the time to go into VR. I don't know when it's going to blow, but it will blow, and it's going to. I know there's a, there's a company called uh, Melody VR and they plant loads of VR points around arenas so you can buy a ticket on your uh, on your headset effectively and choose your seat and you can literally be this At close to, yeah this close to the performer in live so I think that's going to change the world and that can go of... to boxing events pay-per-view ESPN yeah. UFC everything I think that's a great point what there and then you've got augmented realities like Pokemon Go so you look for your phone and there's a creature that, that is the future, 100%. You mentioned Facebook's undervalued. They own Oculus, of course. So that is a VR Oculus company. is a massive VR company. Yeah. Probably the leader now in terms of actual brand name. Yeah, so I think that's the future. And as Lewis said, it's all about what's going to be here for 10 years. There's no point thinking short term, especially when you're dealing with the stock market, which has got a lot of public money in and there's a lot of fluctuation. So you've got to think long term. But if you go and check the companies that Lewis has mentioned and people have, have invested in Facebook previously and lost it, uh, uh, lost money, won money at times, lost money and made money at times. But that, And you only lost money because short you term. sold short. If he'd kept those stocks that he held, yeah. he would have probably, what, tripled your money? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, and I've tripled some of them. Like I won't get into them, but I've tripled some and lost some. But that's part of the game. But going back to what you said earlier, um, if we would have invested in those companies when we started our brands, we would have made so much money, 100 times more. However... Going back to what you said, our skill set wasn't there. Correct. We didn't study, we didn't read, we didn't learn enough to understand, to spot these opportunities. Now we're actively continuously learning on these topics. So if these situations arrive again, which they will, it might be none of those companies that we mentioned there, but we're ready to pounce on them. And that's the key of having that luck or, skill, uh, luck or opportunity or timing. You create all of those with your active, uh, active output to try and learn more on those topics. Yeah. And I'd say, uh, as we spoke about, always in, well, we would be investing in the person behind the company, Correct. the board of the company, and the actual brand itself. How powerful is the brand? So Yeah. And I think me personally, in the next decade, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with MDV, whether, whether we sell, whether, whether I keep it going and open stores. Um, um, we'll see. Um, but in terms of me personally, yeah, I would definitely want to have a great portfolio of stocks. I'd probably more than likely start on a brand. Um, I don't really like property. I've always said that. I think it lacks creativity, although it's safe. Um, but like I said, you know, if we looked at ourselves 10 years ago, mm -hmm. 
I'm 28, you're 27, was just out of school. I just started becoming a professional footballer. I didn't even think about business. So what's to say in the next 10 years, we could be doing something that we never even thought about at this point. So um, it's quite 10 years is quite a, a long term to think. I think you can see five years. Yeah. Well, you said it in the last one, we don't want to tarnish ourselves with brush yeah. and, and say right now we're going to do this, this and this because things change. We spot opportunity so fast. Yeah. And if we spot an opportunity that we don't talk about, we will jump on it. Yeah. And I think the Elon in the, the behind us is the, the key example of that. I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a character, but the guy was PayPal, Tesla, um, what's the rocket company called? Um, uh, SpaceX. SpaceX. The tunnel that he's building under LA. Uh, solar panels. He's, he's done so many things. This guy can do anything. And he's obviously just a genius who uh, studies everything with extreme mm. focus and believes he can do anything. And, and I personally want to not mimic him. He's, I think he's one of the only geniuses in the world, but have the same mentality of like, I can do anything. Yeah. So 10 years is a long way. Five years, I can give you a, yeah. a bit of uh, an idea. For someone who doesn't have a lot of money, but wants to start a brand, failure is quite scary. What's the mindset be behind overcoming fear and taking the dive? That's from Ashley Pinder. I'll answer that, Ash. <laughs> I knew you was going to say If that. you are worried about taking the plunge for a brand or creating a company that can change your life mm -hmm. and you already don't have any money, then what are you risking? Yeah, you're not losing you, anything. You're not losing anything. You shouldn't be involved in this game if you're already thinking like that. Your mindset is completely wrong. And he's in the best position because... When you've got nothing to lose, He's you only have to worry about assuming. yourself. Yeah, you only have to worry about yourself. If you've got if you've got five hundred thousand, fifteen hundred pounds, and you lose it all, you can get that back next month. It's different. Be a millionaire with all the staff on your pressures. Then they should be scared. The, those are the people who've got not only their own assets to lose, but to to lose other people's livelihoods and jobs. So that's the real position of being scared. I think that's the best position to be. I think that's the the opportunity to try it again and again and again until you find something works if that's say 1500 pound try business try it for six months it doesn't work and you lose it and you earn 1500 pound again try another business and then that's the perfect you've got everything to gain and nothing to lose Correct. i think when some people say about lose or fear it really does come down to the outward world looking at them and laughing at them saying ha 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 he or she didn't succeed but those people who are laughing have never ever took a plunge to do anything I personally do not care what anyone outside says about me unless they put their money where their mouth is, their time and their effort and their dedication to try and do something. But guess what? If they have, they would never be commenting on, on another man or woman's uh, effort. It's, uh, I respect anybody who's trying, even if you're failing. As long as you're keeping it real, you're putting in the work, you're not making ego moves, I respect you and I'll help you. I'll be the first person to DM you and say, if you need anything, just text me. But if you're fronting or acting like you're doing more than you are, I'm not going to help you. And furthermore, don't be scared. Like, f f failure is the, is the brother of success. You need them, do you know what I mean? It's, it's part of the game. Yeah. Well, I hope that answered your question a little abruptly, but you, some people need to kick up the arse. And yeah. I hope people listening to this, that, that is it. Um, again, this last one's to do with stocks, so we've already answered that. So I think that's it for the Q&A. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, do let us know in the comments uh, what you want us to do next, whether that's a topic that me and Lewis can cover. Um, we may not always be right, but we're always real. Um, and if there's any celebrities or public figures you'd like us to interview, we're aiming to get someone on the podcast in the next two or three episodes. So do let us know. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, that would be a big help for us. We appreciate it. And do let us know your feedback anyway if there's anything you'd like us to improve on. We always take it on board. Thank you. Nice one.